everybody. I'm Bradley Schaefer. I'm also Soul Cutter on the internet, uh, on Twitter, GitHub, everything else, pretty much. Um, I work for a company called TableXI. We're a small, medium-sized consultancy out of Chicago, Illinois, and we solve problems. So if you have any problems, uh, come talk to me or email me, bradley at tablexi.com. Uh, I also am a contributor on the RSpec core team. And uh, I'm not actually one of the more active contributors right now, but I do really like RSpec. And I, uh, as part of my initiation as a contributor to RSpec, uh, I was let in on a lot of RSpec secrets. So this talk is about uh, things that we don't tell uh, users of RSpec that we use uh, in order to write awesome tests. So you're about to be let in on the secret. Uh, the first one is a lot of people ask me about how to test code that uh, actually has yields uh, within them. And many people don't know, but you can test this really easily using uh, the yield matchers that are included in RSpec expectations. So I put a few examples in here uh, of different ways you can test yielding. Uh, it also works with uh, composable matchers, so if you see the the example with the hash including, uh, anything that pretty much implements triple equals uh, will work in there uh, as far as matching the arguments to a yielded block. Uh, so that's the, uh, the first secret, is that you can test that stuff pretty easily and you don't have to do any like fancy tricks in order to do it. Uh, this next one is actually one of my favorite secrets and it's a feature called aggregate failures. And for a long time, I think the rule of thumb that everybody follows is that there should be only one expectation per test. And I think that that can actually uh, make your test look kind of ugly. And I mean, it works pretty well. Like the test that I wrote out here, it does run and it works. And uh, it, it's not too bad to read the actual code. But if you look at the documentation that gets generated from that kind of uh, arrangement, uh, it really doesn't make any sense. And uh, so like user when registered should be registered is kind of a tautology. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Or when you're registered, you should be registered at a some ridiculous long date string. Uh, so yeah, that's not really, I, I don't think, the best way to write that sort of test. Uh, aggregate failures gives you a tool where it's OK to write tests that have multiple expectations and it will actually tell you of each of the failures within that uh, example block without uh, you know, having it hit the first failure and uh, you fix that one and then it hits the next failure. That's kind of a frustrating way to work uh, within your tests. So there's two ways actually in order to invoke this. The first way is uh, what I'm showing here with the green arrow. Uh, if you tag your example with uh, the word aggregate failures like that, then uh, it will run through all of the expectations uh, within that example. Uh, if you don't know much about the like RSpec uh, example metadata system or whatever, uh, you can come talk to me after this and I will chat with you about it. It's a pretty cool feature. Um, but if that's still too much magic for you, within your example block, you can uh, do aggregate underscore failures, do, and then a block within that for, uh, for whatever expectations that you want to be make sure that they're all run. Um, and the output that you get with this, I think, makes a lot more sense, and it reads a lot better. So, you know, I mean, the example that I wrote uh, at the top makes a lot of sense, and then uh, it kind of outlines each particular line that fails the expectation. And in this case, there's actually one expectation that did pass in there, so it doesn't say anything, but. Uh, so that's one that I use all the time, particularly useful for uh, if you have a test that has pretty expensive setup. Uh, for example, like running Selenium tests and things like that where you hit a page but you want to make multiple expectations. 
uh, I think it's really useful there, and it saves you quite a bit of time. So uh, th those two are built in uh, to RSpec, so you get it kind of out of the box. You don't have to do any special configuration. Uh, this next one does require uh, some, some magic invocation from the spec helper, usually. It's wherever you configure your, uh, your RSpec stuff. So uh, you need to basically uh, put this into your... Oh, no. Oh, no. It's my favorite part. Well... <laughs> In any case, this is more of a workflow one, so anyway, come talk to me about this later. <laughs> Sorry, it's too long. I hope this talk doesn't turn out to be too random, because this is me running on about four hours of sleep and thinking about all the things that I've learned and, and experienced in Mountain West Ruby conferences, a little bit of economics, a little bit of technology and things like that. And so that kind of gelled in my mind this morning, and I thought, I'll do a lightning talk. This is the last Mountain West Ruby conference. I've never spoken at it. Um, this is my last chance. Um, so when I entitled this talk, I called it Reevaluating Value. And the reason why I called it that is because I think our understanding of value is really skewed towards like the classical economics. You, you have supply and demand. You have... Uh, scarcity, you have abundance, and things that are scarce are really valuable. You think about gold, it's really hard to find, and it has some value, people want it, and because it's so scarce, people say, oh wow, gold's really valuable. And the same thing happens with diamonds, and De Beers says, hey, we're going to make the, these diamonds really scarce, and that's going to make them really valuable. But there's really a different way that you can think about value that I think is kind of unique, and I want to give an example of that. So, pretend that it's back in the 1970s, and I have the only fax machine in the world. All right? And I'm proud, I've, I'm excited, I've got the only fax machine in the world. What is the value of that fax machine? Goose egg, right? Nothing. So I'm like, oh, I'm friends with Mike. Here, Mike, I'm going to give you a fax machine. Thank you. And I'm going to make myself another fax machine. So what's the value of Mike's fax machine? Still, but it's worth more than nothing, right? And the crazy thing is that my fax machine suddenly has value. I start creating more and more fax machines, and suddenly everyone who has a fax machine can fax something else to anyone else that has a fax machine. And that idea of scarcity creating value kind of gets flipped on its head. And instead of scarcity creating value, you have abundance creates value. In fact, you can do the same thing with phones or computers. Think about the internet. And there's all these things where instead of scarcity creating value, Abundance is creating value, and the key thing is that if you have something that can create connections and exchange information, the more of them that you have, the better. Uh, think like a single brain cell has zero value, right? But you get billions of them in your mind, and you can think of all kinds of things. You can do all kinds of things. And so as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about um, what's the value that Mountain West Ruby Conference has, um, has given to me because a lot of these videos you can get online, you, you can get on Confreaks and, and watch them and stuff, but to me, the interesting part is that I can come to a Ruby Conference and I can connect with my fellow Rubyists and we can have an exchange, and there's something valuable that's created from that. And, you know, I came to a Mountain West Ruby conference, and Matt was up on stage as we were cleaning up afterwards. He puts on a sombrero, and I'm like, hey, I, I should go talk to Matt, right? And I got a picture, and I was able to talk to him, talk to, 
with him about his family in Japan and being a developer there and things like that. And I was able to make a connection with him and get some value out of that. I remember the first time I, I used XML, the XML Builder but, uh, gem, and I had a bunch of ideas, and I emailed Jim Wyrick, like, hey, you need to fix a bunch of stuff about your gem, right? I had no idea who he was. I just got an email address, and, and he emailed me back, and he kind of set me straight and said, actually, my gem does all those things, and here's how you're using it wrong. And I was simultaneously humbled and encouraged by the fact that he would take some time to kind of help me out, and that there was like a connection there, and that um, that created something valuable for me. So anyway, I just wanted to get up and say thanks to Mike for, for this, for creating value and, and creating a conference for me. So. Let me make sure my notes show up right. There they are. Okay. Okay, so I'm giving this talk because I attribute my professional success to my affinity for tabletop role-playing games. Uh, this is because RPGs have, I got five minutes, have taught me to reason through seemingly impossible situations, uh, work with a team in like, bizarre and artificially constrained scenarios, articulate my reasoning and decisions carefully, and most importantly, appreciate the unique contributions that each person brings to a team. Does that sound familiar to you? It should. Um, so, here's how it works. I'm going to teach you how to play. The Dungeon Master runs the game. Everybody else is a player. They, the Dungeon Master is the arbiter of the rules, the settler of disagreements, and the teller of the story. The players are the actors in the story, but they're actors with self-determination and motivations that extend beyond the setting described by the DM. The DM starts a story and describes how the players' decisions and interactions affect the world around them. The real joy of D&D is in these tables' interactions. It's essentially multiplayer chess with a theater troupe. So, there are many RPGs where it's talking explicitly about Dungeons and Dragons, the rule center on funneling broad concepts into narrow definitions until they can be classified and measured by rolling some dice and comparing the sum of that dice to a difficulty number. That number is decided by the DM, and every DM runs their own ship. All the books are polite suggestions at best. The best DMs live in the moment, fueled and inspired by the power of the story. So, here's the details. You have six attributes, strength, dexterity, endurance, intelligence, charisma, wisdom, and wisdom. Uh, that serve as a foundation for a larger number of skills. Everything you want to do in the game, should it require a measurement to determine success, can be classified into a combination of skill and relevant attribute. Want to kick down a door? That's a strength check. Roll a d20, that's the dice with 20 sides, and add your strength. It's a creaky old wooden door, half rolled it in moldy. Uh, get an 8, and it breaks. Solid steel, nothing but a 20, and then you're just going to rattle it in its frame. You can't kick in the door? Did you try the doorknob? Oh, it's locked? Cool, that's a sleight of hand check. Let's pick it. Uh, sleight of hands associated with dexterity, so roll a d20, add your sleight of hand score and your dexterity check. Strong door, weak lock, get an 11, it pops right open. Every other rule in the game is an extension of this premise. Decide on a course of action, describe it to the DM, negotiate the relevant attribute and skill combination, roll the die, compare the difficulty number, and see what happens. Whether you succeed or fail, the world has changed. The story has changed. Did your failed attempt at kicking open at that door awaken your neighbors? Are they frantically calling 911 or cursing under their breath as they roll over? So the stories are what matters. If you want to be good at D&D, learn to tell stories. Know what details to include and which are best left to the imagination, and practice by doing. I do this by taking lots of pictures and then making up stories about them. This is a really good storytelling picture. If you can imagine that little dog on an enormous adventure, D&D might be the game for you. That's my dog. Uh, here's another story. In our current campaign, I assume the role of Swift the Falcon, a bright for barbarian half-dragon who's more bohemian than Conan. His brother, Majita the Lion, always sends Swift with trading caravans because Swift can speak three lang languages, handy when you're trading hide for ale and silk. And as Swift as Swift is, he cannot read or write because barbarians don't keep tax records. Drisella, played by my girlfriend Brenna, is a mute ex-monk turned wanderer. After an unknown arsonist left her lifetime... Uh, Monastery, a ruin, uh, she took to the road, seeking not revenge, but renewal. Bryn personifies this role well. She won't speak to players during the game, often going hours without a word. Instead, she writes notes to the other players or pantomimes her reactions. So what happens when the mute monk and the illiterate barbarian team up to solve a kidnapping? Wacky hijink, hijinks and adorable pictograph commu communications. So these are pictures that have all inspired stories for my tabletop games. In conclusion, I care more about storytelling and spending time with the people I like than I do about partial cover rules or the varying carry capacity of pack mules or the armor class of, or the armor class of chain mail. 
D&D scratches the itch I have for problem solving, provides a social context to spend time with my friends, and helps me hone the skills that make me good on a team. It gives me a place to tell my stories and experience the stories of others. Thank you. How to be a great developer. Don't use Dexit in front of a group of 200 people. So uh, I'm Ben Eggett. This is also not a talk about skyscrapers. Totally blew it, but Aja inspired me to stick that one in there. Thank you. Um, premise, I've had a, a good opportunity in my life to give a lot of people some advice about starting a career or improving their career or, um, you know, really a lot of people come to me and said, how can I be better at what I do? And I want to share some of that with you today. Uh, first question I'm going to ask, why do we write software? Um, there's a lot of answers to that. Think about that on your own. And who do we build software for? Okay. We build software for people. We build software to enrich people's lives. Now, when you're starting a career, you often feel like this. Um, there's a lot of hesitation. There's a lot of apprehension. There's a lot of unknowns out there. And there's a lack of confidence, generally, when you're entering a room with a lot of experienced people around you. So um, how do you become a great developer? First thing I want to point out, it's my opinion, take it at face value, is tech skills are overrated. They're only part of the equation. Um, when interviewing for a job, this isn't the most important thing. Personality trumps tech skills at almost every time in my book. Experience is very important, but your personality, and not just your personality like, hey, are you funny? Do we get along well? but your capacity, your desire, your passion to learn and improve upon yourself, those are key elements of your personality. When you approach a problem, how do you face it? Do you back down or do you keep yourself calm and collected and overcome it? So you want to be a great developer? There's five things I want to talk about. First is, that should say practice empathy. Practice empathy. So why empathy? Empathy is your ability to understand how a person feels and why they may feel that way. It's your most important skill. Um, when we're writing software, we're writing for people. There's two groups of people in mind, the users that use it and the rest of our team, the people that we have to correspond and work with um, on a daily basis. They're the ones affected by the decisions you make. So one thing I want to point out is you need to be careful in assuming that you know why a decision was made unless you were in the room when it was made. Assumptions are very dangerous, and we see that a lot of times. Any, a lot of times, uh, this leads to interpersonal problems, et cetera. Practice humility. I like this. If you think you know everything, you're wrong. If you think you'll learn everything, you're wrong. Be open to the likelihood that you are wrong about a great many of things. The less you fear being wrong, the more confident you can be. Understand what you do well and what you don't. Keep learning. This has been a consistent theme throughout this conference, and it's been absolutely fantastic for this. I really like this quote. I'll let you read it. So it's up to us. If we want to learn, it's a choice that we need to engage ourselves. Be liberal in learning about new technologies and approaches. Be conservative in using them. Any technology can be the right choice depending on the needs of the project and strengths of the team. It's not Ruby only. It's not Rails only. It's not JavaScript only. It's what's the right tools for the job. Avoid tribalism in work and in community. There's no room for boys club. Enough said I could expand on that in a lot of ways, but please be inclusive and better your community. How can you better your community? Be active. Um, there's events all around you. Here in town, we have the Utah Ruby Users Group. I organize the Drug Weekly Hack Night, Drug Weekly Month Meetup, uh, monthly meetup. Uh, tomorrow, we're having a hack night at a coffee, street, just, coffee shop just down the street. And next month, Mike Reese is going to be talking to us more about robots. So come and learn and do that with us. Uh, for, they're on Wednesdays every week, and the monthly one's first Wednesday of the month. Just so come out to that. Uh, make people's lives better with your skills. Make the community around you better. You don't need to go to some magic city of tech genius to do important work, okay? Share what you learn with the people around you. Ask them to share what they've learned with you. So you want to be a great developer? Practice these things. You'll notice that none of these things had any tech skills in, related to them. This is just how to be a good person, a good employee, a good coworker. And I encourage you to just kind of think about that as you evaluate your decisions. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> I'm kind of a pioneer 
going back to that talk that we were talking about, so I'm going to tell you about a language that, I, that I'm really liking these days. It's crystal, crystal language. It has nothing to do with crystal meth, hopefully. Um, somebody was asking in Twitter to this guy, what's this language all about? And I like how he put a definition together. Friendly syntax, static type checking, modern standard lab, compiles into efficient, easy to distribute native code, macro, self-hosted. So let's try to expand a little bit on that. Yes, it is very cool, but how? Um, the syntax is very similar to Ruby. What you have right there, you can read it. It's Ruby, right? There's one letter difference. What is it? That question mark right next to argv, right? And uh, we're going to talk more about type checking and why that's important. Uh, static type checking, what I call the checking, right? Um, if you look at that and if you look at it with the eyes of Ruby, it's going to run every single time, right? In Crystal, it's not going to run. It's not going to even compile. It's a compile language. Because what it's going to do is going to say, well, the value of A could be a type integer or could be a type nil. And nil doesn't know that, for that declaration doesn't know how to deal with plus. In crystal language, uh, the plus is not defined for nil. And if you cannot, con you cannot call a method that is not defined for all types. So it's not going to compile. It's not going to run even the first time. I, like you can see also, um, I didn't say which type it is. So we tried to figure out as much as it can what type it is. It has a modern standard library. That's all the kind of cool and new stuff already baked into the language. Things like spec that is very similar to our spec, CSV, JSON, XML, YAML, Markdown, uh, HTTP clients and servers even including web sockets built in, OAuth, OAuth2, second round, 11 same HTML builders, all kinds of things already built into the language. Uh, like I said, it compiles into fast native code as in microsecond fast. Uh, what the code that you see on top is a very basic HTTP server. And what you see below is a copy of how it will run. The first time you run it, it took 725 microseconds. Uh, so it did take some time on the first time to run. But every single time after that, it was 82, 57, well below 100 microseconds. Um, it is kind of refreshing to see how fast programs boot and how fast program runs every single time. Um, it doesn't do meta programming like we know in Ruby because that's it's running at runtime. And like we said, it's a compile language, so everything that you need to do in kind of a fancy, smart way, you need to do it in advance. But there are things that you can do with macros to create your own method, method definitions, method builders. It all ends up being valid. It has to be valid crystal code in the end at compile time and not at runtime, but that, this lets you do some nice things with your code. Uh, it is self-hosted, -host, self and what that means, it is written in crystal, most, most of it. If you can look at that, it's 98.2 in crystal, 0.7 in JavaScript, and 0.4 in HTML, and 0.3 in shell. My guess is you speak most, you can easily speak most of those languages, or you already speak those languages. Uh, it also can cross-compile in different platforms. So if you are an OS 10, you can cross-compile it into Linux just in that same machine. Um, I have some links for you here um, about the language. The API is very nice and clear with a nice documentation. I mean, the documentation can go a very long way still, uh, more examples and more things, but there are a lot of cool things you can do there. Um, uh, there are a lot of libraries coming in. Um, there are still a lot that need to be written, and again, it's an opportunity for you to be the one to write the first library, for example, that does things like Hamel, uh, if you're into that kind of thing. In any case, my biggest objective is to pick your interest and have you go and try it out, check it out. I think you're going to love it. Uh, for me, it gives me uh, a different set of challenges and a different set of constraints. Uh, and it gives me a lot of things that I always like, which is speed. But I need to think about the types that I'm using. I need to think and think more about in advance how this is going to be built. And just because I'm a little nostalgic, I had to bring it back. <laughs> there were not enough sombreros in this talk. Uh, and it gives but me a lot. Of Mike, thanks again. Thank Great you. conference.
I've had the opportunity to um, come to a, a number of these different conferences. I don't, obviously don't have my laptop or any slides or anything. I'm very unprepared. Um, yesterday, or actually about a month or so ago, I had a, a, a number of tests that I was, I, I was developing a project, and, and I do the best I can to try to practice good test coverage, and um, I had a sporadic test failure, and it really, really bothered me. I could run the model, the model itself, it would test fine, but when I ran the whole suite of tests, I get this random failure, and I could not figure out how to do it. And I sent an email to URUG, um, didn't get a whole lot of feedback back about it. So yesterday I came here and I watched Ryan do his presentation on building a, a test suite. And I got to say something about the Ruby community. When I first, my, my first, I think it was Mountain West, was up at Snowbird. Ruby Web, okay. So that was the first event that I ever came to related to Ruby. I had never written Ruby. I'd never seen Ruby. I'd heard people talk about it. I went to this event, and I remember seeing these people. Everybody in the room was, like, way up here as far as, I mean, I was just blown away and, and humbled by, you know, I, I'd been programming for 15 years plus at the time and was just blown away by the community. And the welcoming, we talked about this already here a couple of times, you know, the welcome, uh, the way that this community responds to new people and, the, and mentoring, um, I've, I've just got to acknowledge you guys uh, for that. Um, I wouldn't be here if that weren't the case. Um, I love, I, I've gotten to really enjoy Ruby. Anyways, I came in and I had this problem and Ryan was sitting here, I sat down next to him and he's like, oh sure, yeah, I'll look at it. Took me out in the cafeteria and we sat down and he showed me this new gem, this, not new gem, but this gem that he had called uh, Minitest Bisect. Has anyone used it? A couple of people? I had never heard of it before, but I had, you know, 500 tests and, and 1,300 uh, um, assertions in my tests. I know it's not good. Um, and he sat down, we, we had to hack through it a little bit because there was a, a problem with an exception that was being thrown. But in 10 minutes, this thing found the combination of files that resulted in my random error. And we were able to duplicate it. it and it turns out I just had a name collision with, I named it a test class the same as something else. But it would take me forever to find this, or I would have never found it. I would have just said, ah, screw it, it's expected to fail. <laughs> just run the model and you, you're okay. But I, I was just, if you haven't looked at uh, Minitest Bisect, <laughs> um, he's cheating, he's helping me cheat so I don't get buzzed. Um, I recommend doing it because, I mean, within 10 minutes, this thing just went through my whole, my, all of my tests and did every combination it could, is my understanding of how it works, and, and gave me the three files that in combination made this test fail. And then I could take a look at those three files, and, and it was a no-brainer once I did that. Um, other than acknowledging you guys and saying thank you for, and I hope that we can carry on this, this legacy that Mike started with the, the Ruby conferences in Salt Lake. Um, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Hey, I'm, I'm Joey. Um, I'm actually a pretty new programmer. I go by FergMath to Flex on everything, so look me up. Um, I want to talk about... Um, I went through a boot camp, and I, made, and I made a pretty massive transition. I was actually a journalist for the Desert News, um, also for Silicon Slopes, if you even know what that is. Um, we're pretty awesome. But um, this was my old career, and I just trashed it. Um, I went through a boot camp called Def Point Labs. as part of the first class. A lot of my colleagues are here. Woo! Woo! My instructor was Ben Eggett. And I'm going to actually echo a lot of things that Ben said uh, earlier. Um, I now work at MX. It was a long, bumpy road to get to MX, but it's definitely the, my dream job, So, at least so far. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I want to talk about, like, a lot of people ask me, like, how, how did you get, um, how did you um, jumpstart your career? Um, I do a lot of mentoring at DevPoint. I did it in this cohort. I've slacked off quite a bit, but do a lot of mentoring there. And towards the end of the cohort, a lot of people start getting nervous and start, uh, you know, almost panic asking me, what do I do? Um, I, 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 all I have is advice for them. And the first thing is, 
You know, don't assume you're entitled to a job. That's the first piece of advice I would give you in jumpstarting a career, whether you're self-taught or through a boot camp. You're not entitled to a job just like any other line of work. Um, to echo Frank Underwood, one of the worst fictional characters of all time, uh, you are not entitled to anything. You're entitled to nothing. So just keep that in mind. It's not a downer. It's just you got to work at it. Um, knowing Ruby and or Rails doesn't really make you stand out. And you just got to keep in mind that money is not important. You're not entitled to an amazing paying job because you still have to kind of pay your dues just like anywhere else. Um, don't get discouraged when a job doesn't come. Just take the time to get better and become a better programmer. Um, are you qualified? The answer is not, not right out. A lot of companies will have a hard time considering you qualified. Um, and um, here's what actually will make you qualified. And I'm going to echo a lot of what Ben said earlier. And I have three H's for that. Um, triple H, if you will. Any you know, pro wrestling fans out there? Um, <laughs> Hunger, you've got to be hungry. You've got to go out there and get it. You've got to constantly be learning and be excited to learn. That's a huge characteristic for wanting to, to hire someone. Don't you clap, stop it. <laughs> Damn it. Humility. <laughs> What's so funny? I don't understand. Humility, um, it's important to understand that you are new, you don't know everything, and there are tons of people out there that know way more than you, and you need to use that, Okay? And helpfulness, this, the Ruby community is a helpful community. End of discussion. We are helpful people. People will help you. You need to help back. Okay? Don't walk around like this, like the cocky cockatoo here. Don't do that. You are not the stuff. I'm, I almost swore. Um, you're not the stuff. You are, you are not what, as awesome as you think you are. And it's, it's okay. Also, nerdify. You're in, this is what I say to everybody. I quoted myself. I got to work on the humility thing. <laughs> You're a nerd now, so act like it, okay? Act like a nerd. You don't have, it doesn't mean, well, yeah, you should play D&D. It's pretty dope. But it, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about here is you need to go out there and you need to build robots and you need to make cool things and geek out about new languages, and that's what you are now, okay? Just take Garrett Thornburg <laughs> as an example, you got to be this guy right here. He probably got two pins. Um, <laughs> one minute, thank you. Um, finally, you need mentors. You cannot do this alone. End of discussion. You want to see how many mentors I have? These are all my people I consider to be mentors, people who have helped me get to where I am today. If you're on this list, thank you, by the way, very much. Um, I would say also basically anyone at MX, amazing company. They have really helped me get to where I'm at. Finally, Meneswan, okay? It, people, someone will tell you, ultimately, that you are not capable of it, that you will never be a programmer. You tell them to shut up, okay? With your actions. Don't actually say that. <laughs> the, because the, the, point I'm, the point I'm getting at here is those people, to me, aren't really following this. That's not what Ruby community is all about. We all want to be good at this. We all want to share this joy. <laughs> and so there might be some haters. Just ignore them. So... Anyway, that's, that's all I got. Thanks. Uh, five seconds. Can you hear me? Um, I'm Nick. I uh, don't know. Broken. Okay. So, uh, I guess I'll just talk loudly. Uh, so, the, my late talk is I are everywhere. So, when I was watching uh, Tenderless talk, and it reminded me of. <laughs> You know, Ruby has bytecode, and that's pretty awesome. Um, so what does IR mean? Uh, is it infrared, you know, like remotes? Well, no. Is it skyscrapers, you know, like in the sky, really high? No. Uh, it's compiler, li uh, compiler lingo. That was much easier when I wrote it. Uh, intermediate representation is what it means. Uh, and by that, it's... Uh, you could talk about assembly, or Java bytecode, or Ruby's IR, uh, which I want to show a little bit of, uh, or JRuby's IR. Uh, and there are a number of different types of IR. So you can talk about the syntax tree itself. Uh, and you know that's a fairly common IR, but uh, that's not the one that people who are working on compilers always find interesting. And usually, they don't think of that as an IR. 
Um, so there are different kinds of machines that IR can represent. Uh, stack machines, which is a machine that has a list of instructions and a stack. So like you push stuff on the stack and then you perform operations on the things on the stack. And then there are register machines, which is where you have a list of instructions and then a list of registers. Uh, and in that case, you know, it's like, well, what do registers mean? Well, if you look at assembly, you see things like EAX and all these kind of weird uh, acronyms. And those are actually just variables. They're just kind of funny variables. Uh, so I have some code that I want to show a little bit. So I wrote a Fibonacci algorithm because, you know, that's the common, like, demo thing because it's got calls, it's got recursion, everything. Uh, and this is Ruby. Uh, this is Java, and the reason why I have a Java example, uh, I'll get to in a moment. Um, but I don't particularly like Java, uh, so I also wrote it in Mira, which is kind of like Crystal, but for the JVM. Um, and if you notice, the main difference between this and the Ruby is that there's a type annotation, and for some reason the main part is kind of funky. So you can run uh, this and compile it, or this, and you end up with uh, this interesting class file that contains bytecode in it. And if you run a special tool called Java P, then you can look at that bytecode. And it's pretty nifty. So uh, Java will give you all this cool stuff. Like it will tell you all the constants that are used by your file, as well as what the, the list of local variables are. And then it shows you this stuff, which looks kind of like assembly. And so what this is doing is uh, essentially uh, showing you the, the entire implementation of your algorithm, but in a very step-by-step -step way where it's uh, pushing things onto a stack and then performing operations on that stack. So uh, what this actually is doing is um, it's loading the current instance, then it's uh, pushing a, a two onto the stack, then it's uh, doing a comparison. And if you want to look at that, what that actually corresponds to, it's this part, because it's uh, one of the things that it's pushing onto the stack is uh, zero, which is the, the first local. And then it has a go-to depending on, you know, like which branch we're going on. Uh, so, you know, we have this branch, so if A is less than two, then we go here. And if it's more than two, then we do this complicated thing. And the complicated thing is actually just like uh, loading the, the first thing, loading one, then doing a subtraction, and then invoking a method using that as an argument. Uh, other, and then it does the same thing again, but does a subtract two and it invokes fib, and then you add the two things that are on the stack together and you return them. And uh, so Ruby has a very similar IR. Ruby's IR is also, so let me take a step back. So Java uses a stack-based IR. So it uses a stack machine, so it's got uh, instructions and a stack. And so we push things onto the stack and then we collapse, we pull things off the stack and then we uh, do things with them. Uh, and so does Ruby. So like if we were to do the same thing essentially with the Ruby, uh, program I showed you, we'd end up with this big file, which is a little complicated to read, so I cut out some of the pieces. Uh, so in this case, the, the comparison gets turned into this code, which basically gets the local, gets, well, actually, this is the two, this is the local, and then this is the comparison. Um, and it, it is basically the same logic, but the difference is it's a little bit more complicated because, uh, like, Ruby's mechanics about those things are more complicated. The interesting one was JRuby, which uses instructions. So you can get access to all of this stuff. It's under the covers. It's really easy to play with, and you can look at it, and you can see like how everything works underneath everything. And it's pretty accessible when you find the resources for it. Thanks. Wow, I'm honored to be up here on stage. It was so, after so many awesome people. It's been a great RubyConf so far. Um, so yeah, I just want to second what a lot of people said. The Ruby community is amazing, and I mean, the language itself is beautiful, but I mean, I think the main reason all of us are here is it's an awesome community. So let's hope I have Wi-Fi. Okay, so I just want to talk really fast about a gem that I've made and used in production for a few years and uh, continued to improve over time. Um, it's called the Petergate gem. Uh, you can install it like any gem by just saying, putting it in your bundle, putting it in your gem file, or uh, gem install Petergate. Um, it is sort of built around a lot of methods that are included in Devise. So if you're using Devise, then awesome. If not, make sure that your authentication method actually uses, 
at least these methods. And I, I might have forgotten to mention exactly what PeterGate is. Um, it is basically a gatekeeping gem or authorization, uh, similar in some ways to Pundit or uh, CanCan or CanCan, like X100. Um, I feel that it's a lot simpler to use and approaches in a slightly different way, whereas it's not trying to do everything CanCan does, it's just trying to be simple in a lot of ways, like Rails in a lot of ways can be with like before actions and what used to be before filters and strong params. Um, uh, the main things it does is in your model, you would define Petergate in the same way you would define devise, list the number of roles that you wanted, such as admin. Um, you could say whether or not you want to use multiple roles on the same user or just a single role. And then in the controller, you would just post a single line, access, everybody can see show index, users can see everything except destroy, company admins can see all, etc. cetera. Uh, it also has a kind of weird thing that I built in a while ago that allows you to actually say this array of roles can actually see this array of indexes, or this, this array of actions. Uh, and it also, as far as like displaying content versus not displaying content for specific roles, allows you to use the logged in method, uh, which you could pass just an array of roles to, and if any of those happen to be logged in at the same time, it, it will return true. Otherwise, it will return false. Um, there's a few other things that might be useful, such as being able to see all of the available roles from some other object. So there are a few ways you can get those, and I show them here. Uh, let me just uh, pull up a little bit of code first and try demoing that really fast. So terminal. News. This is just a simple, let's just say news app. Oh, yes. So first in the user model, you'll see, yes, thank you. Can everyone see, hear that, see that, whatever you do with your eyes? <laughs> um, can, okay, so in the same way you define devise and say what it's loading, you would just define Petergate and then list that these are the roles it's going to use. In this case, I'm using multiple true. If you don't use multiple true, you can use multiple false. All of this, like devise, is also added by the generator, so you don't actually have to add this yourself, although you would customize it yourself. Um, and then in the post controller, you'll see I'm saying access. Everybody can see the index. Users can see index and show, and editors can see, can see all of the actions. So I mean, that's basically set up in such a way that like, you could see news posts, but you couldn't actually read them unless you were a user, and you couldn't change them unless you were an editor. So uh, let me just uh, actually go to that page. And so this is actually logged in as an admin. As an admin, I can actually add new users and see which roles they have. See, admin has company admin and user. Editor has editor and user. Uh, user just has user. So uh, let me just actually, I do me log in as an editor. So logging out. Cool, my internet works. Anyway, cool. Howdy, everybody. Uh, my name's Andrew Butterfield. And this is my second Mountain West Ruby conference. Uh, I've really enjoyed it, sad it's the last. And I'm super grateful to squeeze in at the end here. Um, and today I want to talk about searching for the unattainable. And I wanted to remind you of three legends that you're probably familiar with that you learned uh, in grade school. Uh, the first one's of Sir Walter Raleigh and his search for El Dorado, the mythical city or empire of gold. Uh, Juan Ponce de Leon and his search for the Fountain of Youth. And lastly, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table and their search for the Holy Grail, or quest. I should use the proper term, quest. Um, so I, I guess I want to talk about commonalities between these three different explorers. Uh, they all had lots of money. Uh, they all had a good group of people with them to help them in their quest or search. 
Uh, they had all the equipment that, at least at the time, uh, was thought that would be needed to, to search for these things. Uh, but they all failed uh, in, in trying to find these unattainable things. And the reason that they, they failed was because these things don't actually exist. Spoiler alert. Sorry if you think that they do. Um, but they don't. Uh, and so... I wanted to talk about, like, what's your holy grail, or, or my holy grail, or what are the things uh, that are getting in the way of you being able to achieve what you perceive to be uh, unattainable, at least right now. And so I want to talk about three different reasons that I've thought about. Um, under the premise that, you know, let's assume you have the money and the resources that you need, you have a good group of people around you, um, and you have the equipment that you need. Uh, but still, there's something that, that isn't quite in your grasp, at least that you feel like. And so, why would that be? So the first reason that I want to talk about is what, what I'm calling the Agile Gambit. And you could substitute any word in there for Agile, but it's a good specific example. And for those of you who aren't chess players out there, a Gambit is a strategy or a move in chess where you sacrifice a piece that's worth less in the hopes that it will give you a strategic advantage uh, in the future. And so I feel like in the processes that we're engaged in as developers um, and in our industry, there's been a huge shift over to agile development. Uh, and the shift is, has been away uh, from something called waterfall. Um, how many people have done waterfall development out there? Cool. I've never done it before, because um, the shift happened before I got into the, the industry. Um, but it definitely feels like a pariah, right? Like a taboo term, like, let's not do waterfall, right? And so we play this, this gambit, uh, this agile gambit, in a lot of our planning. But I think that uh, <clears throat> in agile, sometimes we do it wrong. And we don't do enough of the things that are part of waterfall uh, that are beneficial. And I'm not saying that we should go back and do waterfall in our engineering process. But I think that a lot of times we discount things because other, other people say that we should or an industry says that we should when there is still value there uh, that can be incorporated into our current process. And maybe that's inhibiting us from reaching what's unattainable. The next thing I want to talk about is the streetlight effect. Uh, so I was a Boy Scout. Uh, and I participated in a skit several times on campouts that uh, was about a streetlight. And the story uh, goes something like this. There's a drunk uh, who's under a street lamp. It's nighttime. It's in London. Um, and he is looking for something. And a police officer is walking down the street and sees him and asks him, hey, what are you looking for? Did you lose something? And the drunk says, well, I, lost my, I lost a quarter. Can you help me find it? OK, dang. Um, and the police officer says, sure. So they look for a little bit, and they don't find it. And the officer's like, are you sure you lost it here? And the drunk says, no, I lost it over there in the park. And the officer's like, why are you looking for it here? Um, and, and so really, like, the, the meaning, or I guess, of this story is that sometimes we use tools in the wrong way. Um, and the last thing that I want to talk about, probably won't have very much time, is the Founder's Dilemma. Um, but if you remember Iron Man 1, Tony Stark says, just before he fires the Jericho Misso, missile, uh, this is how Dad did it, this is how America does it, and it's worked out pretty good so far. Uh, it's easy to kind of slip into uh, complacency uh, once we've kind of achieved something and, and not progress. Um, so I challenge you to overcome the Founder's Dilemma, and, and maybe by recognizing these three things, it'll help you to attain the unachievable. Unachie